Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We will soon be taking off on our way to altitude. Please keep your seat belts fastened and remain in your seats. We will be experiencing turbulence until we are above the clouds. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now cruising at altitude. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Altitude is a community of thought leaders and pioneers, cloud architects, and enlightened network engineers who have individually and are now collectively leading their own IT teams and the industry on a path to lift cloud networking above the clouds, empowering enterprise IT to architect, design, and control their own cloud network, regardless of the turbulent clouds beneath them. It's time to gain altitude. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Mullaney, President and CEO of Aviatrix, the leader of multi-cloud networking. All right. Good morning, everybody here in Santa Clara, as well as to the uh, what millions of people watching the live stream worldwide. Uh, welcome to Altitude 2020. All right. So, We've got a fantastic event today. I'm really excited about the speakers that we have today and the experts that we have, and really excited to get started. So one of the things I wanted to just share was this is not a one-time event. This is not a one-time thing that we're going to do. Sorry for the aviation analogy, but you know, Sherry Way, aviatrix means female pilot, so everything we do has an aviation theme. Uh, this is a takeoff for a movement. This isn't an event. This is a takeoff of a, of a movement a multi-cloud networking movement and community that we're inviting all of you to become part of. Um, and, and, and why we're doing that is we want to enable enterprises to rise above the clouds, so to speak, and build their network architecture regardless of which public cloud they're using, whether it's one or more of these public clouds. So the good news for today, and there's lots of good news, but this is one good news, is we don't have any PowerPoint presentations no marketing speak. We know that marketing people have their own language. We're not using any of that, and no sales pitches, right? So instead, what are we doing? We're going to have expert panels. We've got Simone Richard of Gartner here. We've got 10 different network architects, cloud architects, real practitioners. They're going to share their best practices and their real world experiences on their journey to the multi cloud. So, uh, before we start, and everybody know what today is. In the US, it's Super Tuesday. I'm not going to get political, but Super Tuesday, there was a bigger Super Tuesday that happened 18 months ago. And, and Aviatrix employees know what I'm talking about. 18 months ago, on a Tuesday, every enterprise said, I'm going to go to the cloud. And so what that was, was the Cambrian explosion for cloud for the enterprise. So Frank Cabri, you know what the Cambrian explosion is. He had to look it up on Google. 500 million years ago, what happened? There was an explosion of life where it went from very simple single cell organisms to very complex multi-cell organisms. Guess what happened 18 months ago on a Tuesday? I don't really know why, but every enterprise, like I said, all woke up that day and said, now I'm really going to go to cloud. And that Cambrian explosion of cloud went, meant that I'm moving from a very simple, single cloud, single use case, simple environment to a very complex, multi-cloud, complex use case environment. And what we're here today is we're going to go and address that. And how do you handle those, those, those complexities? And when you look at what's happening with customers right now, this is a business transformation, right? People like to talk about transitions. This is a transformation, and it's actually not just a technology transformation, it's a business transformation. It started from the CEO and the boards of enterprise customers where they said, I have an existential threat to the survival of my company. If you look at every industry, who they're worried about is not the other 30-year-old enterprise. What they're worried about is the three-year-old enterprise that's leveraging cloud, that's leveraging AI, 
and that's where they fear that they're going to actually get wiped out, right? And so because of this existential threat, this is CEO-led, this is board-led, this is not technology-led, it is mandated in the organizations. We are going to digitally transform our enterprise because of this existential threat, and the movement to cloud is going to enable us to go do that. And so IT is now put back in charge. If you think back just a few years ago in cloud, it was led by DevOps, it was led by the applications, and it was, like I said, before the Cambrian explosion, it was very simple. Now, with this Cambrian explosion, an enterprise is getting very serious and mission critical. They care about visibility, they care about control, they care about compliance, conformance, everything, governance. Um, IT is in charge, and, and, and that's why we're here today to discuss that. So what we're gonna do today is a bunch of things, but we're gonna validate this journey with customers. Do they see the same thing? We're gonna validate the requirements for multi-cloud because honestly, I've never met an enterprise that is not going to be multi-cloud. Many are one cloud today, but they all say I need to architect my network for multiple clouds because that's just what the, the network is there to support the applications and the applications will run in whatever cloud it runs best in. And you have to be prepared for that. The second thing is, is, is architecture. Again, with IT in charge, you, architecture matters. Whether it's your career, whether it's how you build your house, it doesn't matter. Horrible architecture, your life is horrible forever. Good architecture, your life is pretty good. So we're gonna talk about architecture and how the most fundamental and critical part of that architecture and that basic infrastructure is the network. If you don't get that right, nothing works, right? Way more important than compute, way more important than, stor than storage. Network is the foundational element of your infrastructure. Then we're gonna talk about day two operations. What does that mean? Well, day one is one day of your life. That's where you wire things up. Day two and beyond, I tell everyone in networking and IT, it's every day of your life. And if you don't get that right, your life is bad forever. And so things like operations, visibility, security, things like that, how do I get my operations team to be able to handle this in an automated way, because it's not just about configuring it in the cloud, it's actually about how do I operationalize it. And that's a huge benefit that we bring as Aviatrix. Um, and then the last thing we're gonna talk, and it's the last panel we have, I always say you can't forget about the humans, right? So all this technology, all these things that we're doing, it's always enabled by the humans. At the end of the day, if the humans fight it, it won't get deployed. And we have a massive skills gap in cloud, and we also have a massive skills shortage. You have everyone in the world trying to hire cloud network architects, right? There's just not enough of them going around. So at Aviatrix, we said, as leaders do, we're gonna help address that issue and try to create more people. We created a program that we call the ACE program, again, aviation theme. It stands for Aviatrix Certified Engineer. Very similar to what Cisco did with CCIEs, where Cisco taught you about IP networking, a little bit of Cisco, we're doing the same thing. We're gonna teach network architects about multi-cloud networking and architecture, and yeah, you'll get a little bit of AVHX training in there, but this is the missing element for people's careers and also within their organization. So we're gonna, we're gonna go talk about that. So great, great event, great show. We're gonna try to keep it moving. Um, I next wanna introduce uh, my, uh, my host, uh, he's the best in the business. You guys have probably seen him multiple million times. He's the co-CEO and co-founder of The Cube, John Furrier. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome, great, great speech there, awesome. Yeah. I totally agree with everything you said about the explosion happening and I'm excited here at the heart of Silicon Valley to have this event. It's a special digital event with theCUBE and Aviatrix where we'll be live streaming uh, to millions of people, as you said, maybe not a million. Maybe not. <laughs> um, really to take this program to the world, and this is really special for me because multi-cloud is the hottest wave in cloud, and cloud-native networking is fast becoming the key engine of the innovation. So we got an hour and a half of action-packed programming. We have a customer panel, two customer panels, before that, Gartner's going to come on and talk about the industry. We have a global system integrators going to talk about how they're advising and building these networks and cloud native networking. And then finally, the ACEs, the Aviatrix Certified Engineers, are going to talk more about their certifications and the expertise needed. So let's jump right in and let's ask Simone Richard to come on stage from Gartner. We'll kick it all off. Hi, 
right. Okay, so kicking things off, sitting started, Gardner, the industry experts on cloud. Uh, really kind of more to your background. Talk about your background before you got to Gardner. Yeah, before being at Gardner, I was a chief network architect of a Fortune 5 company that with thousands of sites over the world. And I've been doing everything in IT from a C programmer in IT to a security architect to a network engineer to finally becoming a network analyst. So you rode the waves, and now you're covering in the marketplace with hybrid cloud and now moving quickly to multi-cloud is really yes. what everyone's talking about. Cloud native's been discussed, but the networking piece is super important. How do you see that evolving? Well, the way we see enterprise adopting cloud, first thing you do about networking, the initial phase is they either go in a very ad hoc way, as usually led by non-IT, non like a shadow IT or application people, or sometimes a DevOps team. And it's, it, it just goes as, it's completely unplanned. They create VPCs left and right with different account and they create mesh to manage them and they have direct connect or express route to any of them. So that's, that's a first approach. And on the other side, again, within a first approach, you see what I call the lift and shift way. We see like enterprise IT trying to basically replicate what they have in a data center in the cloud. So they spend a lot of time planning, doing direct connect, putting Cisco routers and F5 and Citrix and any checkpoint, Palo Alto, device that they had in the data center, moving that to the cloud. I gotta ask you, the aha moment's gonna come up a lot in our panels is where people realize that the multi-cloud world, I mean, they either inherit clouds, certainly they're using public cloud and on-premises yep. is, is now more relevant than ever. When's that aha moment that you're seeing where people go, well, I got to get my act together and get on this Well, the, the, the first, right, even before multi-cloud, so of these two approaches, the first one, like the ad hoc way, doesn't scale. At some point, IT has to save them because they don't think about D2, they don't think about operation. They have a bunch of VPC and multiple cloud. The other way, that if you do the lift and shift way, they cannot take any advantages of the cloud. They lose elasticity, auto-scaling, pay by the drink, all these features, all agility features. So they both realize, okay, neither of these ways are good, so I have to optimize that. So I have to have a mix of what I call the, the cloud native services within each cloud. So they start adopting like all the AWS construct, or Azure construct, or Google construct. And that's what I call the op optimal phase. But even that, they they realize after that they're all very different. All these approaches are different, the cloud are different, identity is completely difficult to manage across clouds. Uh, I mean, for example, AWS has accounts, there's subscription in, in Azure and GCP, their projects, it's a, a real mess. So they realize, well, I can't really like concentrate, use the cloud, the cloud product in every cloud, that doesn't work. So I have, I'm going multi-cloud. I like to abstract all of that. I still want to manage the cloud from an API point of view. I don't necessarily want to bring my incumbent data center products, but I have to do that in a more API-driven cloud. So the not, the not scaling piece that you were mentioning, that's because there's too many different clouds. Yes. That's the yes. piece there. Yes. So what are they doing? What are, they re are they building different development teams? Is it software? What's the solution? Well, this, the solution is to start architecting the cloud, and that's the third phase. I call that the multi-cloud architect phase, where they have to think about abstraction that works across cloud. In fact, even across one cloud, it might not scale as well. If you start having like 10,000 security group in AWS that doesn't scale, you have to manage that. If you have multiple VPC, it doesn't scale. You need a third party identity provider. So it, it, it barely scales within one cloud, if you go multiple cloud, it gets worse and worse. Steve, weigh in here, what's your thoughts? I, I thought we said this wasn't going to be a sales pitch for Aviatrix. <laughs> 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 you just said exactly what we do. So anyway, that's a joke. Um, what do you see in terms of, of, of where people are in that multi-cloud? Because like, like a lot of people, you know, everyone I talk to started in one cloud, right? But then they look and they say, okay, but I'm now going to move to Azure and I'm yeah. going to move to, do you see a similar thing? Well, yes, they, they are moving, but they're not, they, there's not a lot of application that use a three cloud at once. They move one app in Azure, one app in AWS, one yeah. app in Google, that's what we see so far. Okay, yeah, I mean, one of the, th yeah. the, 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 
the mistakes that people think is they think multi-cloud. No one is ever going to go multi-cloud for arbitrage. They're not going to go and say, well, today I might go into Azure because I get a better rate in my instance. That's never, do you agree with that? That's never going to happen. What I've seen with enterprise is I'm going to put the workload in the app. The app decides where it runs best. That may yeah. be Azure, may be Google, and for different reasons, and they're going to stick there and they're not going to move. Well, let me ask you but guys. But the infrastructure has to be able to support from a networking team, yeah. be able to do that. Do, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree. And one thing is also very important uh, is connecting to the cloud is kind of the easiest thing. So the wider network part of the cloud, connectivity to the cloud is kind of simple. You know, you I agree. IPsec, VPN, Direct Connect, Express yeah. Route. That's the simple part. What's difficult, and even the provisioning part is easy. You can right. use Terraform and create VPCs and VNets across your three cloud providers. Right. What's difficult is the day two, the operation. So well, this, well, define day two operations. What, is that, what does that actually mean? It's just the day to day operations. The, after, the, you know, the, the, na the natural, let's add an app, let's add a server, let's troubleshoot a problem. So what happened after changes. provisioning? So your life after Something you, changes, now what do you do? So what's the big concerns? I want to just get back to this cloud native networking because everyone kind of knows what cloud native apps are. That's been the hot trend. What is cloud native networking? How do you, what, how do you guys define that? Because that seems to be the hottest part of the multi-cloud wave that's coming is cloud native networking. Well, there's no uh, you know, official Gartner definition, but I can create one on the, on the, on the spot. Is Do it. I just want <laughs> to leverage the cloud construct and the cloud API. I don't want to have to install like, uh, it, it, like, um, for example, the first version was let's put a, a virtual router that doesn't even understand the, the, the cloud environment. Right. If I have, if I have to install a virtual machine, it has to be cloud aware. It has to understand the security group if it's a router. It has to be programmable to the, the cloud API and and understand the cloud environment. You know, one of the things I hear a lot from either CISOs or CIOs or CXOs in general is this idea of, I'm definitely a going API, so it's been an API economy, so API is key on that point. But then they say, okay, I need to essentially have the right relationship with my suppliers, AKA clouds, you call it above the clouds. So the question is, what do I do from an architecture standpoint? Do I just hire more developers and have different teams? Uh, because you mentioned that's a scale point. How do you solve this, this problem of, okay, I got AWS, I got GCP or Azure or whatever, do I just have different teams or I just expose APIs? Where is that optimization? Where's the focus? Well, I think what, what you need from a network point of view is a way, a control plane across the three clouds and be able to use the APIs of the cloud to build networks, but also to troubleshoot them and do day two operation. So you need a view across the three cloud that takes care of routing, connectivity. That's the, you know, that's performance. the, that's the Aviatrix yeah. plug of you yeah. right there. So, so how do you see, so again, you're Gartner, you, 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 you see the industry, you've been a network architect. How do you see this, this playing out? What are the, what are the uh, legacy incumbent client server on-prem networking people going to do well, they need versus to, people like Aviatrix? Well, how do you see that playing out? Well, obviously all the incumbent, like Arista, Cisco, June Emperor, uh, NSX, right. uh, they, they want to basically do the lift and ship part. They want right. to bring, and you know, VMware wants to bring NSX in the cloud, they call that NSX everywhere, and Cisco wants to bring ECI in the cloud, they call that ECI anywhere. Right. So everyone, wa and, and then there's Cloud Vision from Arista and Contrail is in the cloud, so they just want to bring the management plane in the cloud, but it's still based, most of them is still based on putting a VM them and controlling them. Right. You, you extend your management console to the cloud. That's not really cloud native. Right. Cloud native, you almost have to build it from scratch. We like to call that cloud naive. Cloud naive, yes. So close, one letter. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so that was a big conversation at reInvent. Take the T out of cloud native, it's cloud naive. Yeah. That went uh, super viral. You guys got t-shirts now. I know you love yeah. that, but, yeah. but that really ultimately is kind of double-edged sword. You, gotta be, you can be yeah. naive on the, on the uh, architecture side and rolling out, but also suppliers are, can be naive. So how would you define who's naive and who's not? Well, in fact, they're evolving as well. So for example, in Cisco, you, it's a little bit more native than other ones because they really, uh, ACI in the cloud, you, can't, you, you really like configure the APIs of the mm -hmm. cloud. And the NSX is going that way and so is Arista. But they're incumbent, they have their own tools, it's difficult for them, they're moving slowly. So it's much easier to start from scratch, have a new like, and, and you know, a network company that started a few years ago, there's only really two. Aviatrix was the first one. They've been there for at least three or four years. Yeah. 
And there's other ones like Alkira, for example, that just started. Now they're doing more connectivity, but they want to create an overlay network across the cloud and start doing policies and trying, abstracting all the clouds within one platform. So I got to ask you, I interviewed um, an executive at VMware, Sanjay Poonin, and he said to me at RSA last week, oh, there'll only be two networking vendors left, Cisco and VMware. What's your response <laughs> to that? What's your response to that? Obviously, I mean, when you have these waves, there's new brands that emerge, like aviation and others. I think there'll be a lot of startups coming out of the woodwork. How do you respond to that comment? Well, there's still a data center. There's still like a lot of action on campus and there's the WAN. But from the cloud provisioning and cloud networking in general, I mean, they're behind, I think. You know, in fact, you don't even need them to start with. You can, if you're small enough, you can just keep, if you're in AWS, you can use the AWS construct. Uh, they have to insert themselves. I mean, they're running behind from that point of view. Yeah, they're all cer certainly incumbents. I love the term Andy Jassy uses at Amazon Web Services. He uses old guard, new guard to talk about uh, the industry. What does the new guard have to do, the new and new brands that emerge in? Is it be more DevOps oriented? Is it net, net sec ops? Is it net ops? Is it programmability? These are some of the key discussions we've been having. What's your view on how you what, see this programmability? The, uh, the most important part is they have to make the network simple for the dev teams. And from, you cannot, have, you cannot make a phone call and get a VLAN in two weeks anymore. So if you move to the cloud, you have to make the cloud construct as simple enough so that, for example, a, a dev team could say, okay, I'm going to create this VPC, but this VPC automatically being your, associated to your account, you cannot go out on the internet, you have to go to transit VPC. So there's a lot of action in terms of the IAM part, and then you have to put the control around them too. So you, to make it as simple as possible. You guys both, I mean, you're the COC uh, Aviatrix, but also you got a lot of experience going back to networking, going back to, I call the OSI days, which for, for us old folks know what that means. But you guys know what this means. I want to ask you the question, as you look at the future of networking, you hear a couple of objections. Oh, the cloud guys, they got networking, we're all set with them. How do you respond to the fact that networking's changing and the cloud guys have their own networking? What are some of the pain points that's going on premises in these enterprises? So are they good with the clouds? What needs, what are the key things that's going on in networking mm -hmm. that makes it more than just the cloud networking? What's your take on that? Well, I, as I said earlier, that once you, you could pro easily provision in the cloud, you can easily connect to the cloud, is when you start troubleshooting application in the cloud and try to scale. So this, that's where the problem occurs. Steve, what's your take on it? Um, and you'll hear from the from the customers that, that, that we have on stage, and I think what happens is all the, clou the clouds, by definition, designed to the 80-20 rule, which means they'll design 80% of the basic functionality, and they'll leave the 20% extra fun functionality that, of course, every enterprise needs, they'll leave that to ISVs like Aviatrix. Because why? Because they have to make money. They have a service, and they can't have huge instances for functionality that not everybody needs. So they have to design to the common and that's, they all do it, right? They have to. And then the extra, the problem is that Cambrian explosion that I talked about with enterprises, that's all they, that's what they need. That they're the ones who need that extra 20%. So that's, that's what I see is, is there's always going to be that extra functionality that in, a, in, a, in an automated and simple way that you talked about, but yet powerful with the, uh, with the visibility and control that they expect of on-prem. That, that's that kind of combination, that yin and the yang that, that people like us are providing. So I want to ask you, we're going to ask some of the cloud architect customer panels, so it's the same question. Um, this Pioneer's doing some work here, and there's also the laggards who come in behind the early adopters. What's going to be the tipping point? What are some of those conversations that the cloud architects are having out there? Or what's the signs that they need to be on this multi-cloud or cloud native networking trend? What are some of the signals that are going on in their environment? What are some of the, the thresholds or, or, or things that are going on that they can pay attention to? Well, uh, once they have application in multiple cloud and they, have, they get wake up at two in the morning to troubleshoot them, they'll know it's important. <laughs> so I, I think that's, the, uh, that's where the rubber will hit the, hit the road. But as I said, it's easier to provide it. You can say, okay, it's AWS, it's easy. Use a transit gateway, put a few VPCs and you're done. And use, create some presence like Equinix and do a direct connect and express route with Azure. That looks simple. It's the operations. That's when they'll realize, okay, now I need to understand how cloud networking works. I also need a tool that gives me visibility and control. Not, but not only that, I need to, understand the basic underneath it as well. What are some of the day in the life scenarios that you envision happening with multi-cloud? Because if you think about what's happening, 
it kind of has that same vibe of interoperability, um, choice, multi-vendor, because yeah, multi-cloud, essentially multi-vendor. Yes. These are kind of old paradigms that we've lived through with client-server and internetworking wave. What are some of those scenarios of success and that might be possible or would be possible with multi-cloud and cloud-native networking? Well, I think once you have good enough visibility to satisfy your customers, you know, not, not only like to keep the service running and application running, but to be able to provision fast enough, I think that's what you want to achieve. Yeah. Simone, final question, advice for folks watching on the live stream, um, if they're sitting there as a cloud architect or a CXO, what's your advice to them right now in this market? Because obviously public cloud check, hybrid cloud, they're working on that, that gets on premises done, now multi-cloud's right behind it, what's your advice? The first thing they should do is really try to understand cloud networking for each of their cloud providers and then understand the limitation and is what the cloud service provider offers enough or you need to look to a third party? But you don't look at a third party to start with, especially an incumbent one. So it's tempting to say, oh, I'm gonna have a bunch of F5 experts, nothing against F5, I'm gonna bring my F5 in the cloud when you can use an ELB that automatically understand AZs and auto scaling and so on. And you understand that's much simpler, but sometimes you need your F5 because you have requirements, you have like I rules and that kind of stuff that you use for years, you cannot do it, so okay. I have requirements and I'm not met, I'm gonna use legacy stuff. And then you have to start thinking, okay, what about a visibility control about the tree cloud? But before you do that, you have to understand the limitation of the existing cloud providers. So first, try to be as native as possible until things don't work. After that, you can start thinking multi-cloud. Awesome. Great, Great insight. Simone, thank you for coming on. Simone in charge okay. with Gardner. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Simone. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. Informatica is known as the leading enterprise cloud data management company. We are known for being the top in our industry in at least five different products. Over the last few years especially, we've been transforming into a cloud model, which allows us to work better with the trends of our customers. In order to stay agile and effective in a business, you need to make sure that your products and your offerings are just as relevant in all these different clouds than what you're used to and what you're comfortable with. One of the most difficult challenges we've always had is that because we're a data company, we're talking about data that a customer owns. Some of that data may be in the cloud, some of that data may be on-prem, some of that data may be actually in their data center in another region or even another country. And having that data connect back to our systems that are located in the cloud has always been a challenge. When we first started our engagement with Aviatrix, we only had one plan, that was Amazon. It wasn't until later that Azure came up and all of a sudden we found, hey, the solution we already had in place for Aviatrix already working in Amazon now works in Azure as well. Before we knew it, GCP came up, but it really wasn't a big deal for us because we already had the same solution in Amazon and in Azure now just working in GCP. By having a multi-cloud approach, we have access to all three of them, but more commonly, it's not just one, it's actually integrations between multiple. We have some data in Azure that we want to integrate with Amazon. We have some data in GCP that we want to bring over to a data lake in Azure. One of the nice things about Aviatrix is that it gives a very simple interface that my staff can understand and use and manage literally hundreds of VPNs around the world and while talking to and working with our customers who are literally around the world. Now that we've been using Aviatrix for a couple years, we're actually finding that even problems that we didn't realize we had were actually solved even before we came across the problem and it just worked. Cloud companies as a whole are based on reputation. We need to be able to protect our reputation and part of that reputation is being able to protect our customers and being able to protect, more importantly, our customers' data. Aviatrix has been helpful for us in that we only have one system that can manage this whole huge system in a simple, easy, direct model. Aviatrix is directly responsible for helping us secure and manage our customers, not only across the world, but across multiple clouds. Users don't have to be VPN or networking experts in order to be able to use the system. All the members on my team can manage it. 
all the members, regardless of their experience, can do different levels of it. One of the unexpected advantages of Aviatrix is that I don't have to sell it to my management. The fact that we're not in the news at 3 o'clock in the morning, or that we don't have to get calls in the middle of the night, no news is good news, especially in networking. Things that used to take weeks to build are done in hours. I think the most important thing about Aviatrix is it provides me consistency. Aviatrix gives me a consistent model that I can use across multiple regions, multiple clouds, multiple customers. Okay, welcome back to Altitude 2020. For the folks on the live stream, I'm John Furrier, Steve Mullaney with CEO of Aviatrix. For our first of two customer panels, on cloud, with cloud network architects. We got Bobby Willoughby with Aegon, Luis Castillo with National Instruments, and David Shidnick with Fact Set. Guys, welcome to the stage for this digital event. Come on up. Hey, good to see you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, customer panel, this is my favorite part. We get to hear the real scoop. We get the gardener giving us the industry overview. Certainly multi-cloud is very relevant and cloud native networking is the hot trend with the live stream out there and the digital events. So guys, let's get into it. The journey is, uh, you guys are pioneering this journey of, of multi-cloud and cloud native networking and there's soon going to be a lot more coming. So we want to get into the journey. What's it been like? Is it real? You got a lot of scar tissue? Uh, what are some of the learnings? Yeah, absolutely. So multi-cloud is uh, whether or not we, we accept it as network engineers is a, is a reality. Um, like Steve said, about two years ago, companies really decided to, to, just, to just bite the bullet and, and, and move there. Um, whether or not, whether or not we, we accept that fact, we need to now create a, a consistent architecture across, across multiple clouds. And that, that is challenging. Um, without orchestration layers as you start managing different, different tool sets in different languages across different clouds. So that's, it's, it's really important to, to start thinking about that. Guys, um, on the other panelists here, there's different phases in, of this journey. Some come at it from a networking perspective, some come at it from a problem troubleshooting. What, what's your experiences? Yeah, so uh, from a networking perspective, it's been incredibly exciting. It's kind of a once in a generational uh, opportunity to look at how you're building out your network. You can start to uh, embrace things like infrastructure as code that maybe your peers on the systems teams have been doing for years, but it just never really worked on prem. So it's really, uh, it's really exciting to look at uh, all the opportunities that we have and then all the uh, interesting challenges that come up that you, uh, you, that you get to tackle. And in fact said, you guys are mostly AWS, right? In yep, at, right cloud. now though, we're, we are looking at multiple clouds. We have production workloads running in, in multiple clouds today, uh, but a lot of the uh, initial work has, has been uh, with Amazon. And you've seen it from a networking perspective, that's where you guys are coming at it from? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Bob, what's your? You know, we evolved more from a customer requirement perspective. Started out primarily as AWS, but as the customer needed more uh, uh, resources from Azure, like HPC, uh, you know, Azure AD, things like that, and even recently Google, Google Analytics, uh, our journey has evolved into more of a multi-cloud environment. Steve, <coughs> weigh in on the architecture, because this is going to be a big conversation here. I want you to lead this section. Yeah, so I mean, I think you guys agree the journey, you know, it seems like the journey started a couple of years ago, got real serious. Um, the need for multi-cloud, whether you're there today, of course, it's going to be there in the future. Um, so that's really important. I think the next thing is just architecture. I'd love to hear what you, you know, uh, had some comments about architecture matters. It all starts, I mean, every enterprise I talk to, maybe talk about architecture and the importance of architecture, maybe, Bobby. Yeah, so from an architecture perspective, we started our journey five years ago. Wow, okay. Uh, and uh, we're just now starting our fourth evolution of our network architecture. Okay. And we call it network and security, NetSec, yep. uh, versus just as network. Yep. Uh, and that uh, fourth generation architecture is be based primarily upon uh, Palo Alto Networks and Aviatrix. Right. Uh, Aviatrix doing the orchestration piece right. of it. Uh, but that journey came because of the need for simplicity, okay. the need for a multi-cloud orchestration uh, okay. without us, us having to go and do reprogramming efforts across every cloud as it comes along. Right. I guess the other question I, I, I also had around architecture is also, Luis, maybe just talk about, I know we've talked a little bit about you know, scripting, right? And, and some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so for us, we started we started creating uh, the network constructs with cloud formation, and we've we've stuck with that for for the most part. What's interesting about that is today, on premise, we have a lot of a lot of automation around 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 how we provision networks. But 
cloud formation has become a little bit like the new manual for us. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're now having issues with having to, to automate that component and making it consistent with our on-premise architecture, making it consistent with Azure architecture and Google Cloud. So uh, it, it's really interesting to see, to see companies now bring that layer of abstraction that SD-WAN brought to the, mm -hmm. to the WAN side. Now it's going up into, into, the, into, into the, the cloud networking architecture. Yeah. So on the fourth generation, Avi, you mentioned you're on fourth gen architecture. What have you guys, what have you learned? Is there any lessons, scar tissue, uh, what to avoid, what worked? What was some of the, uh, the path, what was the path uh, that you took? It's probably the biggest lesson there is that when you think you finally figured it out, you haven't, right? Amazon will change something, Azure will change something, you know, Transit Gateway is a game changer. Uh, so, uh, and listening to the business requirements is probably the biggest thing we need to do up front. Um, but, uh, I think from a simplicity perspective, uh, we, like I said, we don't want to do things four times. We want to do things one time. We want to be able to write to an API, which Aviatrix has, and have them do the orchestration for us so that we don't have to do it four times. How important is architecture in the progression? Is it you guys get thrown in the deep end to solve these problems, or are you guys zooming out and looking at it? It's a, I mean, how are you guys looking at the architecture? I mean, you can't get off the ground if you don't have the network there. So all of those, you know, we're, we've gone through similar evolutions where we're on our fourth or fifth evolution. Uh, I think about what we started off uh, with Amazon without a direct connect gateway, without a transit gateway, without um, uh, a lot of the things that are available today, kind of the 80-20 that Steve was talking about. Uh, just because it wasn't there doesn't mean we didn't need it. So we needed to figure out a way to do it. We couldn't say, oh, you need to come back to the network team in a year and maybe Amazon will have a solution for it, right? You, we need to do it now and, uh, and evolve later and maybe optimize or change the way you're doing things in the future, but don't sit around and wait, you can't. I'd love to have you guys each individually answer this question for the live stream because it comes up a lot. A lot of cloud architects out in the community. What should they be thinking about? The folks that are coming into this proactively and or realizing that the business benefits are there. What advice would you guys give them on architecture? What should be, they be thinking about and what are some guiding principles you could share? So I would start with uh, looking at an architecture model that, that, can, that can spread and, and give consistency to the, different, to the different cloud vendors that you will absolutely have to support. Um, cloud vendors tend to want to pull you into using their native tool set, and that's good if only it was realistic to talk about only one cloud, but because it doesn't, it's, it's, um, it's super important to talk about and have a conversation with the business and with your technology teams about a consistent model. So that's the... David. Yeah, uh, we were talking uh, as a group earlier about day two operation. So how do I design, how do I do my day one work so that I'm not you know, spending 80% of my time troubleshooting or managing my network? Because if I'm doing that, then I'm missing out on ways that I can make improvements or embrace new technologies. So it's really important early on to figure out how do I make this as uh, low maintenance as possible so that I can focus on the things that uh, the team really should be focusing on. Bobby, your advice yeah. to the architect. I don't know what else I can add to that. Yeah. Simplicity of operations is, is key, right? All right, so the holistic <coughs> view of day two operations you mentioned, let's jump in. Day one is you're, you're, you're getting stuff set up. Day two is your life after, right? This is kind of what you're getting at, David. So what does that look like? Uh, how, what are you envisioning as you look at that 20 mile stair out post multi-cloud world, what are some of the things that you want in a day two operations? Yeah, uh, infrastructure as code is really important to us. So how do we how do we design it so that we can fit uh, start making network changes uh, and fitting them into like a release pipeline and start looking at it like that rather than somebody logging into a router CLI and troubleshooting things in, a, in an ad hoc nature. Um, so moving more towards a DevOps model. You guys, anything to add on that day two? Yeah, I would. I would love to add something. So, in terms of day two operations, you can um, you can either sort of ignore the day two operations for a little while, where you get well, well you get your your feet wet, um, or you can start approaching it from the beginning. The fact is that the, the the cloud native tools don't have a lot of maturity in that space, and when you run into an issue, you're going to end up. Uh, having a bad day going through millions and millions of logs just to try to understand what's going on. So uh, that's something that, that the industry just now is beginning to, to, to realize it's, a, it's such, a, such a big gap. Yeah, I think that's key because for us, we're 
we're moving to more of an event-driven or operations. In the past, monitoring got the job done. It's impossible to monitor, monitor something that's not there when the event happens, right? So the event-driven application and then detection is important. Yeah, I think uh, Gardner was talking about the cloud-native wave coming into networking. That's going to be a serious thing. I want to get your guys' perspectives. I know you have <coughs> different views of how you came into the journey and how you're executing. And I always say the beauty's in the eye of the beholder, and that kind of applies to how the network's laid out. So, Bobby, you guys do a lot of high-performance encryption, both on AWS and Azure. That's kind of a unique thing for you. How are you seeing that impact with multi-cloud? Yeah, and that's a new requirement for us too, where we, uh, we have a requirement to encrypt. And they, if you ever get the question, should I encrypt, should I not encrypt? The answer is always yes. You should encrypt when you should, can encrypt. From our perspective, we, uh, we need to migrate a bunch of data from our data centers. We have some huge data centers. Uh, and in getting that data to the cloud is, uh, is, is, a, is a timely expense in some cases. So, we have been mandated that we have to encrypt everything leaving the data center. So we're looking at using uh, the Aviatrix Insane Mode appliances to be able to encrypt you know, 10, 20 gigabits of data as it moves to the cloud itself. David, you're using Terraform, you got FireNet, you got a lot of complexity in your network. What do you guys look at the future for your environment? Yeah, so something exciting that we're working on now is FireNet. So for our security team, they obviously have a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge base around Palo Alto. Uh, and with our commitments to our clients, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not very easy to shift your security model to a specific cloud vendor, right? So there's a lot of SOC 2 compliance and things like that where being able to take some of what you've, you know, you've worked on for years on-prem and put it in the cloud and have the same type of assurance that things are going to work and be secure in the same way that they are on-prem uh, helps make that journey into the cloud a lot easier. And Luis, you guys got scripting, you got a lot of things going on. What's your, what's your unique uh, angle on this? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So full disclosure, I'm, I'm not a not not an Aviatrix customer yet. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. We want to hear the truth. So yeah, that's good. <laughs> Tell us what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? Um, no, really. Um, when you when you talk about um, implementing uh, a, a tool like this, it's it's really just really important to to, to talk about automation and focus on on value. So. Uh, when you talk about things like encryption and, and things like, um, um, so yeah, encrypting tunnels and encrypting the path and, and those things are it should it should it should be second nature really uh, when you when you look at building those backends and managing them with your team it becomes really painful. So uh, tools like Aviatrix that that add a lot of automation it's out of out of sight out of mind you can focus on the value and you don't have to focus on. So I got to ask you guys, obviously Aviatrix is here, they're, they're a supplier to the, this sector, but you guys are customers. Everyone's pitching you stuff. People are knocking on you, buy my stuff. How do you guys have that conversation with the suppliers, like the cloud vendors and other folks? What's, the, what's it like? We're API all the way, you got to support this. What are, some of the, what are some of your requirements? How do you talk to and evaluate people that walk in and want to uh, knock on your door and, and, and pitch you something? What's the conversation like? Um, it's definitely, it's definitely API driven. Um, we we definitely look at the at, at the API structure of the, the, the vendors provide um, before we select anything. Um, that that is always uh, first of mind, and also what what problem are we really trying to solve? Usually, people try to sell or try to give us something that isn't really uh, valuable, like implementing a, a Cisco solution on the on the on the cloud isn't really, doesn't really add a lot of value. That's where we go. David, what's your conversation like with, with, with suppliers? Do you have a certain new way to do things? As, as it becomes more agile, essentially networking becomes more dynamic, what are some of the conversations with the either incumbents or new new vendors that you're having? What, are, what do you require? Yeah, so ease of use is definitely uh, definitely high up there. Uh, we've had some vendors come in and say, you know, hey, you know, when you go to set this up, we're going to want to send somebody on site and they're going to sit with you for a day to configure it. And that's kind of a red flag. Well, wait a minute, you know, do we really, if, uh, if one of my uh, really talented engineers can't figure it out on his own, what, what's going on there and why is that? So, uh, you know, having, having some ease of use and the team being comfortable with it and understanding it um, is really important. Bobby, how about you? I mean, the old days was do a bake-off and you know, the winner takes all. I mean, is it like that anymore? I mean, what's evolving? You know? We did a bake-off last year for SD-WAN. So, but that's different now because now when you, when you get the product, you can, you can install the product in AWS and Azure, have it up and running in a matter of minutes. 
And uh, so the key is, is that it, can you be operational you know, within hours or days instead of weeks, right? But do we also have the flexibility to customize it to meet your needs? Because you don't want to be you don't want to be put into a box with the other customers when you have needs that sur that surpass their their needs. Yeah, I can almost see the challenge that you guys are living where you've got the cloud immediate value, depending on how you can roll up any solutions. But then you have might have other needs, so you got to be careful not to buy into stuff that's not shipping. So you're trying to be proactive at the same time. You deal with what you got. I mean, how do you guys see that evolving? Because multi-cloud to me is definitely relevant, but it's not yet clear how to implement across. How do you guys look at this baked versus you know future solutions coming? How do you balance that? Um, so again, so right now we we're we're taking the 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 ad hoc approach and and experimenting with the different concepts of cloud uh, and and really leveraging the, the native constructs of each cloud. But, but there's, a, there's a breaking point for sure. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you don't get to scale this, uh, like, like Simon said, and you have to focus on being able to deliver uh, a developer uh, their, their sandbox or their, their play area for, for, the, for the things that they're trying to build quickly. And the only way to, to do that is with, a, with, with some sort of consistent orchestration layer that allows you to so you expect a lot more stuff to be coming pretty quickly I, in this I, area. I do expect things to start to start maturing uh, quite quite quickly this year. And you guys see a similar trend, new stuff coming fast? Yeah, yeah. Our, probably the biggest challenge we've got now is uh, being able to segment within the network, uh, being able to provide segmentation between production, non-production workloads, even businesses, because we support many businesses worldwide, and and uh, isolation between those is is a, is a key criteria there. So the ability to uh, identify and quickly isolate those workloads is, is key. So the CIOs that are watching are, <clears throat> are saying, hey, take that hill, do multi-cloud, and then you know, the bottoms up organization, they like, pause, you're kind of like off a little bit. It's not how it works. I mean, what is the reality in terms of implementing you know, in as fast as possible? Because you know, the business benefits are clear, but it's not always clear on the technology how to move that fast. Yeah. What are some of the barriers? What are the blockers? What are the enablers? I think the reality is, is that you may not think you're multi-cloud, but your business is, right? So I think the, the biggest barrier there is understanding what the requirements are and how best to meet those requirements in, in a secure manner. Uh, because uh, you need to make sure that things are working from a latency perspective, that things work the way they did. And, and get out of the mind shift that, you know, if it's a tier three application in the data center, it doesn't have to be a tier three application in the cloud, right? So lift and shift is, is not the way to go. Yeah, scale's a big part of what I see as the competitive advantage of a lot of these clouds, and you know, it used to be proprietary network stacks in the old days, and then open systems came, that was a good thing. But as clouds become bigger, there's kind of an inherent lock-in there um, with the scale. How do you guys keep the choice open? How are you guys thinking about interoperability? What are some of the, um, uh, conversations that you guys are having around those key concepts. Well, when we look at when we look at the, from from a, from a networking perspective, it it it's really key for you to just enable enable all the all the clouds to be to be able to communicate between them. Developers will will find a way to use the cloud that best suits their their business needs. Right. Um, and and like uh, like you said, it, it's whether whether you're in denial or not of of the multi cloud fact that, that your company is in already. Um, that's it, it becomes really important for you to move quickly. Yeah, and uh, a lot of it also hinges on how well is the provider uh, embracing what that specific cloud is doing. So are they are they swimming with Amazon or Azure and just helping facilitate things? So they're doing the you know the heavy lifting API work for you, or are they swimming upstream and they're trying to hack it all together in a messy way? And so that helps you, you know, stay out of the lock-in because they're, you know, if they're doing, if they're using Amazon native tools to help you get where you need to be, it's not like Amazon's going to release something in the future that completely, uh, you know, makes you uh, have designed yourself into a corner. Uh, so the closer they're, the more cloud native they are, the more, uh, uh, the easier it is to, um, uh, to deploy. But you also need to be aligned in such a way that you can take advantage of those cloud native technologies. Will it make sense? TGW is a game changer in terms of cost and performance, right? So to completely ignore that would be wrong. But uh, you know, if you needed to have encryption, you know, TGW is not encrypted, so you need to have some type of a gateway to do the VPN encryption. You know, so the Aviatrix tool will give you the, the beauty of both worlds. You can use TGW or the gateway. Well, uh, real quick, on the last minute we have, I want to just get a quick feedback from you guys. I hear a lot of people say to me, "Hey, the, I, the pick the best cloud for the workload you got." 
then figure out multi-cloud behind the scenes. So that seems to be, do you guys agree with that? I mean, is, is it, do I go mul one cloud across the whole company or this workload works great on AWS, that workload's great on this. From a cloud standpoint, do you agree with that, that premise? And then where does multi-cloud stitch them all together? Yeah, um, from, a, from an application perspective, it, it, it can be per workload, but it can also be a, an economical decision. Uh, certain enterprise contracts will, will pull you in one direction to add value. Um, but the, the, the network problem is still the same. Yeah, it doesn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't want to be trying to fit a square into a round hole, right? Yeah. So if it, it, if it works better on that cloud provider, then it's our job to make sure that that service is there and people can use it. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. You just need to stay ahead of the game. Make sure that the, the network infrastructure is there, secure, is available, and is multi-cloud capable. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you guys are just validating that it's the networking game now. Cloud, storage, compute, check. Networking is where the action is. Awesome. Thanks for your insights, guys. Appreciate you uh, coming on the panel. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you guys. See you Bye, Lisa. Okay, welcome back on the live feed. I'm John Furrier, Steve Bellaney, my co-host with Aviatrix. I'm with theCUBE for this special digital event. Our next customer panel, got great, another set of cloud network architects, Justin Smith with Zora. Justin Broadley with Ellie May and Amit Otrija with Koopa. Welcome to stage. All right, thank you. How are you? Thank you, thank you. Hey, Amit, that's it, how are you? Okay, did he, did he say it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, he's got all the the cliff notes from the last session. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> R rinse and repeat. Yeah. yeah. No, we're going to go under the hood a little bit. I, mean, I think they nailed the, um, what we've been reporting and we've been having this conversation around. Networking is where the action is because that's the end of the day. You got to move a packet from A to B and you got workloads exchanging data. So it's really killer. So let's get started. Uh, Amit, what are you seeing as the journey of, of multi-cloud? As you go under the hood and say, okay, I got to implement this. I have to engineer the network make it enabling, make it programmable, make it interoperable across clouds. I mean, that's like, I mean, almost sounds impossible to me. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems impossible, but if you are running an organization which is in running infrastructure as a code, and it, it is easily doable. Like you can use tools out there that's available today. You can use third party products that can do a better job, but, but put your architecture first. Don't wait, architecture may not be perfect. Put the best architecture that's available today <coughs> and be agile to iterate and um, make improvements over the time. We got two Justins over here, so I have to be careful when I point a question to Justin. <laughs> they both have to answer. But okay, journeys, what's the journey been like? I mean, is there phases? We heard that from Gardner. Uh, people come into multi-cloud and cloud native networking from different perspectives. What's your take on the journey, Justin? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we started out very much focused on one cloud. Uh, and as we started doing acquisitions, we started doing new uh, per products in the market, the need for multi-cloud becomes very apparent very quickly for us. And so you know, having an architecture that we can plug and play into and be able to add and change things as it changes is super important for what we're doing in the space. Justin, your journey? Yeah, so, so for us, um, we were very ad hoc oriented. Um, and the idea is that we were reinventing all the time, trying to move into these new things and coming up with great new ideas. And so rather than it being some iterative approach with our deployments that became a number of different deployments. Um, and so we shifted that toward, and the network has been a real enabler of this, is that it, there's one network and it touches whatever cloud we want it to touch and it touches the data centers that we need it to touch and it touches the customers that we need it to touch. Our job is to make sure that the services that are available in one of those locations are available in all of the locations. So the idea is not that we need to come up with this new solution every time, it's that we're just iterating on what we've already decided to do. Before we get into the architecture section, I want to <coughs> ask you guys a question. I'm a big fan of, you know, let the app developers have infrastructure as code, so check. But having the right cloud run that workload, I'm a big fan of that if it works, great. But we just heard from the other panel, you can't change the network. So I want to get your thoughts. What is cloud native networking? And is that the engine really that's the enabler for this multi-cloud trend? What's you guys take on? We'll start with Amit, what do you think about that? Yeah, so you are going to have workloads running in different clouds, and the workloads would have affinity to one cloud over other, but how you expose that, it's a matter of how you are going to build your networks, how you are going to run security, how you are going to do egress, ingress out of it. So you said networking is the big problem to yes. solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, what's the, what's the solution? What's the, the key uh, pain points and problem statement? 
I mean, the key, the key pain point for most companies is how do you take your traditionally on-premise network and then blow that out to the cloud in a way that makes sense. You know, IP conflicts, you have IP space, you have public IPs on-premise as well as in the cloud, and how do you kind of make a, a sense of all of that? And I think that's where tools like Aviatrix make a lot of sense in that space. From our side, it's, it's really simple. It's latency, it's bandwidth, and availability. Um, these don't change whether we're talking about cloud or data center or even corporate IT networking. <clears throat> so our job, when, when these, all, all of these things are simplified into like S3, for instance, and our developers want to use those, we have to be able to deliver that and for, the, for a particular group or another group that wants to use just, just GCP resources. Um, these aren't, th we have to support these re requirements and these wants as opposed to saying, hey, that's not a good idea. No, our job is to enable them, not to disable them. Do you think, guys, do you guys think infrastructure as code, which I love that, I think it's, that's the future it is. We saw that with DevOps. But as you start getting into networking, is it getting down to the network portion where it's network as code? Because storage and compute working really well. You're seeing all Kubernetes and service mesh trend. Network as code. Reality, is it there? Is it still got work to do? It's absolutely there. I mean, you mentioned net DevOps, and it's, it's very real. I mean, in Coupa, we build our networks through Terraform and on, on not only just Terraform, build an API so that we can consistently build VNets and VPC all across in the same way. So you guys are and, doing it? Yeah, and even security groups. And then on top, when Aviatrix comes in, we can peer the networks, bridge, bridge all the different regions through uh, code. Same for you guys, what yeah, do you think about this? Everything we deploy is done with automation. Um, and then we also run uh, things like Lambda on top to, to make changes in real time. Uh, we don't make manual changes on our network. Uh, in the data center, funny enough, it's still manual, um, but the cloud has enabled us to move into this automation mindset. And, and all my guys, that's what they focus on is, is bringing now what they're doing in the cloud into the data center, which is kind of opposite <laughs> of what it should be. So it's full or DevOps. what it used to be. It's full DevOps then. Yes. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was similar. Uh, On-prem is still somewhat very manual, although we're moving more and more to Ninja and, and Terraform type concepts. Uh, but everything in the production environment is, is code, confirmation, Terraform code, and now coming into the data center at the same time. I just wanted to jump in on uh, Justin Smith, one of the comments that you made, because that's something that we always talk about a lot, is that the center of gravity of architecture used to be an on-prem, yep. and now it's shifted into cloud. And once you have your strategic architecture, what, you, what do you do? You push that everywhere. So what you used to see at the beginning of cloud was pushing the architecture on-prem into cloud. Now, I want to pick up on what you said. Do you others agree? that the center of architect of, of gravity is here. I'm now pushing what I do in the cloud back into on-prem. Mm -hmm. and, and then so first that, and then also in the journey, where are you at from zero to 100 of, of actually in the journey to cloud? Do you, are you 50% there? Are you 10%? <clears throat> yeah, so I mean. Are you evacuating data centers next year? I mean, where, where are you guys at? Yeah, so there's, there's two types of gravity that you typically are dealing with in a migration. First is data gravity and your data set and where that data lives. And then the second is the network platform that interrupts right. all that together. Right. Um, in our case, uh, the data gravity is still mostly on-prem, but our network is now extending out to the app tier that's going to be in cloud. Right. Eventually, that data gravity will also move to cloud as we start getting more sophisticated. But you know, on our journey, we're about halfway there. Okay. We're about halfway through the process. We're taking a handle of you know, lift and shift. And, and when did that start? We started about three years ago. Okay. Okay. Well, for Coupa, it's a very different story. <laughs> it started from a garage and 100% on the cloud. Yeah, so it's yeah. a business spend management platform as a software as a service run 100% on the cloud. That was like 10 years ago, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. guys are riding the wave. Love the yeah. architecture. Yeah. Justin, I want to ask you, Zora, you guys mentioned DevOps. I mean, obviously, we saw the huge observability wave which is essentially network management for the cloud, in my opinion. Right, right. Yeah, it's more dynamic, but this is about visibility. We heard from the last panel, you don't know what's being turned on or turned off from a services standpoint at any given time. How is all this playing out when you start getting into the DevOps down? Well, this, layer? this is the big challenge for all of us is visibility um, when, when you talk transport within a cloud. Um, you know, we, very interestingly, we have moved from having a backbone that we bought, that we own, that would be data center connectivity. We now, I work for, Zora is a subscription billing company, so we want to support the subscription mindset. So rather than going and, and buying circuits and having to wait three months to install and then coming up with some way to get things connected and resiliency and redundancy, I, my backbone is in the cloud. I, I use the cloud providers interconnections between regions to transport data across. 
And, and so if you do that with their native solutions, you, you do lose visibility. There, there are areas in that that you don't get, which is why controlling you know, controllers and having some type of management plane is a requirement for us to do what we're supposed to do and provide consistency while doing it. A great conversation. I loved what you said earlier, latency, bandwidth, I think availability with your Simple. top three things. Yep. Guys, SLA, I mean, you just do ping times between clouds. It's like, you don't know what you're getting for uh, round trip times. This becomes a huge kind of risk management, black hole, whatever you want to call blind spot. How are you guys looking at the interconnects between clouds? Because, you know, I can see that working from, you know, ground to cloud on per cloud, but when you start dealing with multi-clouds workloads, I mean, SLAs will be all over the map, won't they just inherently? But how do you guys view that? Yeah, I think we, we, we talked about workload and we know that the workloads are going to be different in different clouds, but they're going to be calling each other. So it's very important to have that visibility that you can see how data is flowing at what latency and what availability is, our, is there and our SRE team needs to operate on that. So it's, it's so really key. So use the software dashboard, look at the times and look at the latency. In the old days, strong swan, open swan, you try to figure it out. <laughs> in the new days, you have to figure out. Justin, better. what's your answer to that? Because you're in the middle of it. Both yeah, I mean, I think the, the key thing there is that we have to plan for that failure. We have to plan for that latency in our applications. It's something you start tracking in your SLI, something you start planning for, and you loosely couple these services in a much more microservices approach. So you actually can handle that kind of failure or that type of unknown latency. And unfortunately, the cloud has made us much better at handling uh, exceptions in a much better way. You guys are all great examples of cloud native from day one. I mean, you guys had the, when did you have the tipping point moment or the epiphany of saying, hey, Multi-cloud's real, I can't ignore it. I got to factor it into all my design, design principles and, and everything you're doing. What's the, was there a moment or was it, was it from day one? No, there were two, two reasons. One was the business. So in business, there was some affinity to not be in one cloud or to be in one cloud. And that drove from the business side. So as a cloud architect, our responsibility was to support that business. And other is the technology. Some things are really running better in like if you're running .NET workload or you're going to run machine learning or AI. So, so the, you, have, you would have that preference of one cloud over other. So, Guys, any thoughts on that? That was the bill that we got from AWS. I mean, that's, that's what drives <laughs> a lot of these conversations is the financial viability of, of what you're building on top of. Um, it, which is, so we, this failure domain idea, which is, which is fairly interesting, how do, how do I solve or guarantee um, against a failure domain? You have methodologies with, um, you know, backend direct connects or interconnect with GCP. All of these ideas are, are something that you have to take into account, but that transport layer should not matter to whoever we're building this for. Our job is to deliver the frames and the packets. Um, what that flows across, how you get there, we want to make that seamless. And so whether it's a public internet API call or it's a backend connectivity through direct connect, it doesn't matter. It just has to meet a contract that you've signed with your application folks. Yeah, that's the availability piece. Justin, your thoughts on that? Any, any comment on that? Uh, so actually, multi-cloud's become something much more recent in the last six to eight months, I'd say. Uh, we always kind of had a very much an attitude of like, moving to Amazon from our private cloud is hard enough. Why complicate it further? Uh, but the realities of the business, and as we start seeing you know, improvements in Google and Azure and different technology spaces, the need for multi-cloud becomes much more important. As well as as our acquisition strategies have matured, we're seeing that companies that used to be on-premise that we typically acquire are now very much already on a cloud. And if they're on a cloud, I now need to plug them into our ecosystem. And so yeah. that's really changed our multi-cloud uh, story in a big way. I'd love to get your thoughts on the clouds versus the clouds, because you know you compare them, Amazon's got more features, they're rich with features. Obviously, you know, the bills are high because people are using them. But Google's got a great network, right? I mean, Google's network's pretty damn good. And then you got uh, Azure. What's the difference between the clouds? Who, where do they fall? Whether they peak in certain areas better than others? What are, what are the characteristics? Which makes one cloud better? Do they have a unique feature that makes Azure better uh, than Google and vice versa? What do you guys think about the different clouds? Yeah, to my experience, I think uh, there is, the approach is different in many places. Um, Google has a different approach, very DevOps friendly, and you can run your workload, like the, the, your network can span regions. I mean, so, but our application ready to accept that. Uh, Amazon is evolving. I mean, I remember 10 years back, Amazon's network was a flat network. We would be <laughs> launching servers in 10.0.0 slash 8, right? And, <laughs> and the, then VPC Could've came out. <laughs> English for the live feed. <laughs> Not good. So, so the VPC concept came out, multi-account came out. So they are evolving. Azure had a late start, but because they have a late start, they saw the pattern and they, they have some mature setup on the 
Nicholas. Yeah, a lot of sales yeah, guys too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're all trying to say they're equal in their own ways. Um, I think they all have very specific design philosophies uh, that allow them to be successful in different ways, and you have to kind of keep that in mind as you architect your own solution. For example, Amazon has a very much a very regional affinity. They don't like to go cross-region in their architecture, uh, whereas Google is very much it's a global network. We're going to think about it as a global solution. Um, I think Google also has the advantage that it's third to market, and so it has seen what Azure did wrong, it's seen what AWS did wrong, and it's made those improvements, and I think that's one of their big advantages. They got great now. scale, too. Justin, thoughts on the cloud? Yeah, so, yeah, Amazon built from the system up, and Google built from the network down. Um, so their ideas and approaches are, are from a global versus a regional. I agree with you completely. That, that, that is the big number one thing. Um, but the, if you look at it from the outset, um, interestingly, the the inability or the ability for Amazon to limit layer two broadcasting and, and what that really means from a VPC perspective changed all the routing protocols you can use, all the things that we have built inside of a data center to, to provide resiliency and, and, and make things seamless to users, all of that disappeared. Um, and so because we had to accept that at the VPC level, now we have to accept it at the WAN level. Google's done a better job of being able to overcome those things and provide those traditional network facilities to us. Uh, it's just a great panel, we can go all day here, it's awesome. So I heard, um, we go, we'll get to the cloud native naive question, so kind of think about what's naive and what's cloud, I'll ask that next. But I got to ask you, I had a conversation with a friend, he's like, WAN is the new LAN. So if you think about what the LAN was at a data center, yeah. WAN is the new LAN, because you're talking about the cloud impact. So that means SD-WAN, the old SD-WAN is kind of changing <coughs> to the new LAN. How do you guys look at that? Because if you think about it, what LANs were for inside of premises, was all about networking, <laughs> high speed. But now when you take the WAN and make it essentially a LAN, do you agree with that and how do you view this trend and uh, is it good or bad or, or is it ugly? And what's, what's your guys' take on this? Yeah, I think it's a, it, it, it's a thing that you have to work with your application architect. So if you are managing networks and if you are a SRE engineer, you need to work with them to expose the unreliability that would bring in. So the application has to handle a lot of this um, the difference in the latencies and uh, and the reliability has to be worked through the application there. Land, WAN, same concept, is it BS? <laughs> it's okay uh, I mean, I think same. we've been talking about for a long time the erosion of the edge. And so is this is just a continuation of that journey we've been on for the last several years. As we get more and more cloud native and we start about APIs, the, the ability to lock my data in a place and not be able to access it really goes away. And so I think this is just a continuation of that thing. I think it has challenges. We start talking about WAN scale versus LAN scale. The tooling doesn't work the same. The scale of that tooling is much larger. Uh, and the need to automation is much, much higher in a WAN than it was in a LAN. And that's the reason why you're seeing so much infrastructure as code. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, I'll go back again to this. Uh, it's bandwidth and it's latency, right, that, that define those two um, LAN versus WAN. But the other thing that comes up more and more with cloud deployments is where is our security boundary? And where can I extend this uh, secure aware appliance or set of rules to, to to protect what's inside of it. Um, so for us, we're, we're able to deliver VRFs or, or route forwarding tables for different segments wherever we're at in the world. And so they're, they're trusted to talk to each other, but if they're gonna go to some place that's outside of their, their network, then they have to cross a security boundary and where we enforce policy very heavily. Yeah. So, so for me, there's, it's not just land WAN, it's, it's how does environment get to environment, more importantly. That's a great point, and security we haven't talked to yet, but that's got to be baked in from the beginning of this architecture. Thoughts on security, how you guys are dealing with it? Yeah, start from the base. Uh, have app to app security built in, have TLS, have encryption on the data at transit, data at rest, but as you bring the application to the cloud and they're going to go multi-cloud, talking to o over the internet in some places, well, have app to app security. I mean, that's as simple. I mean, our principle is day, security is day zero every day. And so yeah. we, we always build it into our design, build it into our architecture, into our applications. It's encrypt everything, it's TLS everywhere. It's make sure that that data is secured at all times. Yeah, one of the cool trends at RSA, just as a side note, was the data in use mm -hmm. encryption piece, which is the homomorphic stuff is pretty oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, all right, guys, final question. You know, we heard on the earlier panel was also trending at reInvent. If you take the T out of cloud native, it spells cloud naive. Okay, they got shirts now, Aviatrix kind of got this trend going. What does that mean to be naive? So if you're uh, to your peers out there watching on the live stream and also the suppliers that are trying to you know, supply you guys with technology and services, what's naive look like and what's native look like? When, when is someone naive about implementing all this stuff? So for me, because we are in 100% cloud, for us, its main thing is 
ready for the change. And you will, you will find new building blocks coming in mm. and the network design will evolve and change. So don't be naive and think that it's static. Evolve with the change. I think the big naivety that people have is that, well, I've been doing it this way for 20 years and been successful. It's going to be successful in cloud. The reality is that's not the case. You have to think some of the stuff a little bit differently, and you need to think about it early enough so that you can become cloud native and really enable your business on cloud. Yeah, for me, it's uh, it's being open-minded, right? The the our industry, the network industry as a whole, um, has been very much I'm smarter than everybody else, and we're going to tell everybody how it's going to be done. Um, and we, we, we fell into a lull when it came to producing infrastructure. And, and, and so embracing this idea that we can deploy a new solution or a new environment in minutes as opposed to hours or weeks or, or months in some cases is really important. And, and so, you know. So it's naive our, being closed-minded, native being open-minded. Exactly. And, and it took a, for me it was, that, that was a transformative kind of, uh, where I was looking to solve problems in a cloud way as opposed to looking to solve problems in this traditional old school way. All right, well, I know we're out of time, but I asked one more question, so you guys are so good. It could be a quick answer. Um, what's the BS language when you, the BS meter goes off when people talk to you about solutions? What's the kind of <laughs> jargon that you hear? That's the BS meter going off. What are people talking about that, in your opinion, you hear and you go, that's total BS. What, what triggers you? So, so that I have two lines out of movies that are really, that I can, if, if I say them without actually thinking them, uh, it's like 1.21 gigawatts, oh, you're out of your mind from Back to the Future, right? Somebody's giving you all these big <laughs> <these banks. laughs> and then uh, And then Martin Mull and, and uh, Michael Keaton and Mr. Mom when he goes 220, 221, whatever it takes. Yeah. Those two right there, if those go off in my mind as somebody's talking to me, I know they're full of baloney. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of speeds and feeds, a lot of speeds and feeds, a lot yeah, of- Yeah, just data, just, it, it, instead of talking about what you're actually doing and solutioning, for, you're talking about, well, it does this, 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 and this. Okay, 220, 221, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. Justin, what's your take? Uh, anytime your I start seeing the cloud vendors start benchmarking against each other, it's yeah. your workload is your workload. You need to benchmark yourself. Don't don't listen to the marketing on that. That's that's just all. And then what triggers you on the BS meeting? I think if somebody explains you and not simple, they cannot explain you in simplicity, then, then it's all bullshit. <laughs> well, sound, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for the great insight, great panel. How about a round of applause? <laughs> For practitioners. DXC is a solutions integrating company and we service customers from all industry verticals and we're helping them to move to the digital world. So as a solutions integrator, we interface with many, many customers that have many different types of needs and they're on their IT journey to modernize their applications into the cloud. So we encounter many different scenarios, many different reasons for those migrations, all of them seeking to optimize their IT solutions to better enable their business. We have our CPS organization, it's Cloud Platform Services. We support AWS, Azure, Google, Alibaba, Oracle, will help move those workloads to wherever it's most appropriate. No one buys the house for the plumbing. Equally, no one buys the solution for the networking. But if the plumbing doesn't work, no one likes the house. And if this network doesn't work, no one likes the solution. So the network is ubiquitous. It is a key component of every solution we do. The network connectivity is the lifeblood of any architecture. Without network connectivity, nothing works. Properly planning and building a scalable, robust network that's going to be able to adapt with the application needs, it's critical when encountering some network design and talking about speed to deployment, Aviatrix came up in discussion and we then further pursued an interview. DXC products that incorporate Aviatrix is part of a new offering that we are in the process of developing that really enhances our ability to provide cloud connectivity for the clients. Cloud connectivity is a new line of networking services that we're getting into as our clients move into hybrid cloud networking. It is much different than our traditional based services and Aviatrix provides a key component in that service. Before we found Aviatrix, we were using just native peering connections. But there wasn't 
a way to visualize all those peering connections. And with multiple accounts, multiple contexts for security, with Aviatrix, we were able to visualize those different peering connections of security groups. It helped a lot. Especially in the areas of early deployment scenarios, we're quickly able to then take those deployment scenarios and turn them into scripts that we can then deploy repeatedly. Their solutions were designed to work with the cloud native capabilities first. And where those cloud native capabilities fall short, they then have solution sets that augment those capabilities. I was pleasantly surprised, number one, with the Aviatrix team as a whole and their level of engagement with us. You know, we weren't only buying the product, we were buying a team that came on board to help us implement and solution. That was really good to work together to learn both what Aviatrix had to offer as well as enhancements that we had to bring that Aviatrix was able to put into their product and meet our needs even better. Aviatrix was a joy to find because they really provided us the technology that we needed in order to provide multi-cloud connectivity that really added to the functionality that you can't get from the basic cloud providing services. We're taking our customers on a journey to simplify and optimize their IT infrastructure. Aviatrix certainly has made my job much easier. Okay, welcome back to Altitude 2020 for the digital event for the live feed. Welcome back. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE with Steve Mullaney, CEO of Aviatrix for the next panel from global system integrators to folks who are building and working with folks on their journey to multi-cloud and cloud native networking. We've got a great panel. George Buckman with DXC and Derek Monahan with WWT. Welcome to the stage. Hey, thank you. All right. All right. Okay, you guys are the ones out there um, advising building and getting down and dirty with multi-cloud and cloud native networking. We just heard from the customer panel. You can see the diversity of where people come into the journey of cloud. It kind of depends upon where you are, but the trends are all clear. Cloud native networking, DevOps up and down the stack. This has been the main engine. What's your guys take of the, this journey to multi-cloud? What are you guys seeing? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's critical. I mean, we're seeing all of our enterprise customers enter into this. They've been through the migrations of the easy stuff. You know, now they're trying to optimize and get more improvements. So now the tough stuff's coming on, right? And you know, they need their data processing near where their data is. So that's driving them to a multi-cloud um, environment. Yeah, we heard some of the edge stuff. Yeah. I mean, you guys are, exactly. you've seen this movie before, but now it's a whole new ball game. What's your take? Yeah, so I'll give you a hint. So our, our practice is not called the cloud practice. It's the multi-cloud practice. Oh. And so if that gives you a hint of how we approach things, it's very consultative. And so when we look at what the trends are, if I look, let's look at a year ago. About a year ago, we were having conversations with customers. Let's build a data center in the cloud. Let's put some VPCs, let's throw some firewalls, let's put some uh, DNS and other infrastructure out there and let's hope it works. This isn't a science project. So what we're trying to, we're starting to see is customers are starting to have more of a vision and we're helping with that consultative nature, but it, it's totally based on the business. And you got to start understanding how the lines of business are using the apps and then we evolve into that next journey, which is a foundational uh, approach to- What are some network. of the problem statements that yeah. your customers are solving? When they come to you, what are the top things that are on their mind? Obviously the ease of use, agility, all that stuff, but what specifically are they, they dig digging into? Yeah, so complexity. I think when you look at a multi-cloud approach, I, in my view is network requirements are complex. You know, I think they are, but I think the approach can be, let's simplify that. So one thing that we, we try to do, and this is how we talk to customers, is let's, just like you simplify, and Aviatrix simplifies the automation orchestration of cloud networking, we're trying to simplify the design, the planning, implementation of infrastructure across multiple workloads, across multiple platforms. And so the way we do it is we sit down, we look at, not just use cases, and not just the questions in common we t anticipate, we actually build out, based on the business and functional requirements, we build out a strategy and then create a set of documents, and guess what, we actually build it in the lab. And that lab, that we platform we built, proves out this reference architecture actually works. Absolutely, we, we implement similar concepts. I mean, we, they're proven practices, they work, right? So that, well, George, you mentioned that the hard part's now upon us. Are you referring to networking? What is specifically what you're getting at in Terrence? So the easy part's done now. So for the enterprises themselves, migrating their more critical apps or more difficult apps into the environments, you know, they've just, we've just scratched the surface, I believe, on what 
uh, enterprises are doing to move into the cloud to optimize their environments, to take advantage of the scale and uh, speed to deployment and to be able to better enable their businesses. So they're just now really starting the, to... So do you, get, do you guys see what I talked about? I mean, in terms yeah. of the Cambrian explosion, I mean, you're both monster system integrators mm. with, you know, top fortune enterprise customers, you know, really rely on you for, for guidance and consulting and so forth and deploy their networks. Is that something that you, you've seen? I mean, did you, does that resonate? Did you notice a year and a half ago and all of a sudden the importance of cloud for enterprise shoot up? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing it I mean, okay. in, in, in our internal environment as yeah. well. You know, we're a huge company ourselves, right. customer zero, right. or our internal right. IT. So we're experiencing that in, in, internally okay. in every other, one of our other customers. So I, I have another question, oh. and I don't know the answer to this, and a lawyer never asks a question that you don't know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. DXC and WWT, massive system integrators. Why Aviatrix? Yep. So, great question, Steve. So, I think uh, the way we approach things, I think we have a similar vision, a similar strategy. How you approach things, how we approach things at Worldwide Technology. Number one, we want to simplify the complexity. And so, that's your number one priority is let's take the networking, let's simplify it. Um, and I think part of the other uh, point I'm making is we have, uh, we see this automation piece as not just an afterthought anymore. If you look at what customers care about, visibility and automation is probably the at the top three, maybe the third on the list. And I think that's where we see the value. And I think the partnership that we're building and what I, what I get excited about is not just putting yours in our lab and, and showing customers how it works, it's co-developing a solution right. with you, figuring out, hey, how can we make this better? Right. Visibility is a huge thing, just yep. in security alone, network, everything's around visibility. What automation um, do you see happening in terms of progression, order of operations, if you will, what's the low hanging fruit? What are people working on now? And what are, what are some of the aspirational goals around when you start thinking about multi-cloud and automation? Yep. So I wanted to get back to Answer that question. question. <laughs> I yeah. wanted to answer your question. You know, <laughs> what led us there and why Aviatrix? You know, uh, in working some large internal IT projects and, and looking at how we were going to integrate those solutions. You know, we like to build everything with recipes. We're, network is probably playing catch up in the DevOps world, but with a DevOps mindset, looking to speed to deploy, support all those things. So when you start building your recipes, you take a little of this, a little of that, and you mix it all together. Well, when you look around, you say, wow, look, there's this big bag of aviatrix. Let me plop that in. That solves a big part of my uh, problems that I have to speed to integrate, speed to deploy, and the operational views that I need to run this. Uh, so that was so what led me there. How about reference architectures? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, the, you know, they came with a, a full slate of reference architectures already out there and ready to go that fit our needs. So it was very, very easy for us to integrate those into our recipes. What do you guys think about all the multi-vendor interoperability mm -hmm. conversations that have been going on? Choice has been a big part of multi-cloud in terms yep. of, you know, customers want choice. They, you know, they'll put a workload in the cloud if it works, but this notion of choice and interoperability has become a big conversation. It is, and I think our approach, and that's the way we talk to customers, is let's, let's speed and de-risk that decision-making process. And how do we do that? Because interoperability is key. You're not just putting, it's not just a single vendor. We're talking, you know, many, many vendors. I mean, think about the average number of cloud applications a customer uses a business, an enterprise business today. You know, it's, it's above 30, it's, it's skyrocketing. And, so what we do, and we look at it from an interoperability approach, is how do things interoperate? We test it out, we validate it, we build a reference architecture that says, these are the critical design elements. Now let's build one with Aviatrix and show how this works with Aviatrix. And I think the, the important part there, though, is the automation piece that we add to it and visibility. So I think the visibility is what's, what I see lacking across the industry today. And the cloud native, that's been a big topic. Yep. Okay, in terms of Aviatrix, as you guys see them coming in, they're one of the ones that are emerging and the new brands emerging with multi-cloud. You still got the old guard incumbents with huge footprints. How are customers dealing with that, that kind of uh, component and dealing with both of them? Yeah, I mean, we're, we have customers that are ingrained with a particular vendor and you know we have partnerships with many vendors. So our objective is to provide the solution that meets that client. And they all want multi-vendor, they all want interoperability. Correct. All right, so I got to ask you guys a question while we were defining day two operations. What does that mean? I mean, you guys are looking at the big business and technical components of architecture. What does day two operations mean? What's the definition of that? 
Yeah, so I think from our perspective, my experience, we, you know, day two operations, uh, whether it's it's not just the, you know, the orchestration piece and setting up and let it, let it automate and have some, you know, change control. You're, you're looking at this from a day two perspective. How do I support this ongoing and make it easy to make changes as we evolve? The, the, the cloud is very dynamic. The, um, the nature of how the fast is expanding, the number of features is astonishing. Trying to keep up to date with the number of just networking capabilities and services that are added. So I think day two operation starts with a fundamental understanding of you know, building out, supporting a customer's environment um, and making it the automation piece easy from, from you know, a, a distance, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, taking that to the, the next level of being able to enable customers to have catalog items that they can pick and choose, hey, I need this network connectivity from this cloud location back to this on-prem and being able to have that automated and provisioned uh, just simply by ordering it. For the folks watching out there, guys, take a minute to explain as you guys are in, in the trenches doing a lot of good work, what are some of the engagements that you guys get into? How does that progress? What is the, what's, what happens there? They call you up and say, hey, I need some multi-cloud or you're already in there. I mean, take us mm -hmm. through why, how someone can engage uh, to use a global SI to come in and make this thing happen? What's, what's the typical engagement look like? Yeah, so from our perspective, we, we typically have a series of workshops and, and a methodology that we, we kind of go along the journey. Number one, we have a foundational approach. And I don't mean foundation, meaning the network foundation, that's a very critical element. We got to factor in security and we got to factor in automation. So when we think about foundation, we do a workshop that starts with education, a lot of times we'll go in and we'll just educate the customer. What is VPC sharing? You know, what is a private link in Azure? How does that impact your business? Uh, we have customers that want to share services out in an ecosystem with other customers and partners. Well, there's many ways to accomplish that. So our goal is to, you know, understand those requirements and then uh, build that strategy with them. Thoughts, George? On, on yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm one of the guys that's down in the weeds making things happen. So I'm not the guy on the front line interfacing with the, the customers every day but we have a similar approach. You know, we have a consulting practice that will go out and, and apply their practices to see what those- And when do you parachute in? Yeah, and when I parachute <laughs> in is, I, I'm on the back end working with our offering development leads for, for networking. So we understand or are seeing what customers are asking for and we're on the back end developing the solutions that integrate with our own offerings as well as enable other customers to just deploy quickly to meet their connectivity needs. So the patterns are, are similar. Great, final question for you guys, I want to ask you to paint a picture of mm -hmm. what success looks like. And you don't have to name customers, you don't have to get in and, and reveal kind of who they are, but what does success look like in multi-cloud? As you, as you paint a picture for the folks here and watching on the live stream, if, if someone says, hey, I want to be multi-cloud, I got to have my operations agile, mm -hmm. I want full DevOps, I want programmability, security built in from day zero, what does success look like? Yeah, I think success looks like this. So when you're building out a network, the network is a harder thing to change than some other aspects of cloud. So what we think is, even if you're thinking about that second cloud, which we have, most of our customers are on two public clouds today, they might be dabbling in that, is you build that network foundation, that architecture that takes in consideration where you're going. And so once we start building that reference architecture out that shows, this is how to approach it from, a multi-cloud perspective, not a single cloud. And let's not forget our branches, let's not forget our data centers, let's not forget how all this connects together because that's how we define multi-cloud. It's not just in the cloud, it's on-prem and it's off-prem. And so collectively, I think the key is also is that we provide them an HLD. You got to start with a high-level design that can be tweaked as you go through the journey, but you got to give a solid structural foundation and that, that networking, which we think most customers think as not, not the network engineers, but as an afterthought. We want to make that the most critical element before you start the journey. Yeah. George, from your seat, how does success look for you? So, you know, it starts out on these journeys, often start out people not even thinking about what is going to happen, what, what their network needs are when they start their migration journey to the cloud. So I want the success to me looks like them being able to end up not worrying about mm -hmm. what's happening in the network when they move to the cloud. Good point. Guys, great insight. Thanks yeah. for coming on, Cher and Penn. How about a round Good of applause point. for the global system integrators? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey, start. Okay, welcome back from the live feed. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, Steve Mullaney, CEO of Aviatrix. My co host, our next panel is the Aviatrix Certified Engineers, also known as ACES. This is the folks that are certified, they're engineering, they're building these new solutions. Please welcome Toby Foss from Informatica, Stacey Linear from Teradata, and Jennifer Reed with Victor Davis to the stage.
I want to know. Oh, there it is. All right. How is this? Toby, where's the jacket? How are you? You got to show it, baby. How are you? Where's your jacket, Toby? <laughs> you get it done. That's awesome. I was just going to, I was just going to rib, uh, rib you guys and say, where's your jackets? And Jen's got the jacket on. Right. Okay, good. Love the Aviatrix Aces uh, pilot gear there above the clouds. That's right. Storing to new heights. That's right. So guys, Aviatrix Aces, love the name. I think it's great. Certified. This is all about getting things engineered. So there's a level of certification. I want to get into that. But first, take us through the day in the life of uh, an ace. And just to point out, Stacy's a squad leader. So he's he's like a squadron tra leader. Squadron leader. Yeah. Uh, squadron leader. So he's got a bunch of aces underneath him. But share your perspective, day in the life. Jennifer, we'll start with you. Uh, sure. So I have um, actually a, a whole team that uh, works for me, both in the, in the North America, both in the U.S. and in Mexico. And so uh, I'm eagerly working to get them certified as well Great. so I can become a squad leader myself. Um, but, <laughs> but it's important because one of the, the critical gaps that we've found is um, people having the networking background uh, because they're, you graduate from um, college and you have a lot of computer science background, you can program, you've got Python. But networking and packets, they just don't get. And so uh, just taking them through all of the processes that it's really necessary to understand when you're troubleshooting is really critical. Mm -hmm. And um, because you're going to get an issue where uh, you need to figure out where exactly is that happening on the network. You know, is, is, is my, my issue just in the VPC? Is it on the instance side as a security group? Or is it going on-prem? Mm -hmm. And is it something actually um, embedded within um, Amazon itself? I mean, I sh troubleshot an issue for about six months going back and forth with Amazon, uh, and it was the VGW and VPN um, because they were <laughs> auto-scaling on two sides. And um, we ended up having to pull out the Cisco's and put in Aviatrix so I could just say, okay, it's fixed. And uh, actually, actually help the application teams get to that and get it solved. Yeah. But um, taking a lot of junior people and getting them through that certification process yeah. so they can understand and see the network the way I see the network. I mean, look, I've been doing this uh, for 25 years. When I got out, when I went in the Marine Corps, that's what I did. And coming out, the network is still the network. But people don't get the same training they get they got in the 90s. Well, it's just don't. so easy just write some software and the network takes care of itself, yeah. right? These software I know, guys. it's pixie yeah. dust. Toby, what you, we'll get, I'll come back to that. <laughs> I want to come back to that, that problem solved with Amazon, but Toby. I think the, the only life. thing I have to uh, add to that is that it's always the network fault. Um, <laughs> as long as I've been in networking, it's always been the network's fault. That's true. And uh, I'm even to this day, you know, it's still the network's fault. And part of being a network guy is that you need to prove when it is and when it's not your fault. And uh, that means you need to know a little bit about a hundred different things. Um, to make that. And point. now you got a full stack DevOps, you got to know a lot more times yep. than another hundred. And these Stacey, times are changing, yep. Stacey, you're a squadron leader, get that right. What is what is a squadron leader first? Can you describe what it is? What I think it's do? probably just <laughs> leading all the, the network components of it, but I think from my perspective, when to piggyback what you asked them was, it's about no issues and no escalation. So if, if my day is like that, I'm happy to be That's a good it. outcome. Yep. That's a good day. It sure is. Is I there good days? Day. There's good days? Well, you <laughs> just said you had a good day with Amazon. <laughs> Jennifer, you mentioned the Amazon thing. This brings up a good point. You know, when you have these new waves come in, you have a lot of new things, new use cases, a lot of the finger pointing, it's that guy's problem, that girl's problem. So what is, right. how do you solve that? And how do you get the young uh, guns up to speed? Is there training? Is it this where the certification comes in? Well, this is where the certification is really going to come in. I, I know when we, uh, we got together at reInvent, one of the, the questions that, uh, that we had with, with Steve and the team was, what, what should our certification look like? You know, should we just be teaching about what Aviatrix troubleshooting brings to bear? Like, what should that be like? And I think Toby and I were like, no, 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 no. That's going a little too high. We need to get really low because the, the better someone can get at actually understanding um, what's actually happening in the network and, and where to actually troubleshoot the problem, how to step back each of those processes. Because without that, it's just a big black box and they don't know, right, right. you know, because everything is abstracted in Amazon and in, a in Azure and in Google. It's abstracted and they have these virtual gateways. They have uh, VPNs that you just don't have the logs on. Right. And so you just don't know. And so then what tools can you put in front of them of where they can look? 
because there are flow logs. Well, as long as they turned on the flow logs when they built it, you know, and there's like each one of those little things that, well, if they had decided to do that when they built it, it's there. But if you can come in later to really supplement that with training to actual troubleshoot and do a packet capture here as it's going through, then teaching them how to read that right. even. Yeah, Toby, we were talking before we came on, up on stage about your career, you've been networking all your time, and then you know, you're now mentoring a lot of younger people. Yeah. How is that going? Because the people who come in fresh, they don't have all the old war stories. Like, they, don't. they don't, they don't. You talk about, the, you know, it's never fall. I walk in bare feet in the snow when I was your age. I mean, it's so easy now, right? They yeah. say, what's your take on how you train the young people? So I've noticed two things. One is that they are up to speed a lot faster in generalities of networking. Um, they can tell you what a network is in high school level now, where I didn't learn that till midway through my career. And uh, um, they're learning it faster, but they don't necessarily understand why it's that way here. You know, everybody thinks that it's always slash 24 for a subnet, and they don't understand why you can break it down smaller, or why it's really necessary. Um, so the, the ramp up speed is much faster for these guys that are coming in but they don't understand why and they need some of that background knowledge to see where it's coming from and why is it important. And us old guys, that's where we thrive. So. Jennifer, you mentioned you got in from the Marines. Tell us about when you got into networking, how, what was it like then and compare it now. Because oh my God. They're, they're, they're <laughs> almost like we heard earlier, static versus dynamic. Don't be static because back then you just set up the network, you got a perimeter. Yeah, no, there good. was no such thing. Yeah, <laughs> no, so back in the, the day, I mean, I mean, we had Banyan Vines for email. And you know, we had Token Ring. And I had to set up Token Ring networks and figure out why that didn't work. Um, because how many of things were actually sharing it. Um, but then actually just cutting fiber and running fiber cables and dropping them over um, you know, shelters to plug them in. And oh crap, they swung it too hard and shattered it. Now I got to sit and figure eight polish this thing and actually shoot light to see if it works. I mean, that was the network. Crimp five cat five cables to run an ethernet, you know? And then from that, just setting up the network switches, dumb switches, like those were the most common ones you had. Uh, then actually configuring routers and, you know, logging into a Cisco router and actually knowing how to configure that. And it was funny because I had gone all the way up and was a software product manager um, for a while. So I've gone all the way up the stack. And then uh, two and a half, three years ago, I came across to, uh, to um, work with Entity Group that became Victor Davis. But we went to help one of our customers, Avis, and it was like, okay, so we need to fix the network. Okay, I haven't done this in 20 years, but all right, let's get to it. You know, because it really fundamentally does not change. Yeah. Yeah. It's still the network. I mean, I've had people tell me, well, you know, when we go to containers, we will not have to worry about the network. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you don't, I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And then, but this with the programmability is really interesting. It, so it really I think is. this brings up the certification. What are some of the new things that people should be aware of that come in with the Aviatrix A certification? What are some of the highlights? Can you guys share some of the, some of the highlights around the certification? Mm -hmm. I think some of the importance is that it's, um, it doesn't need to be vendor specific for network generality or basic networking knowledge. And instead of learning how Cisco does something or how Palo Alto does something, we need to understand how and why it works as a basic model and then understand how each vendor has gone about that problem and solved it in a general. Um, that's true in multi-cloud as well. Um, you can't learn how cloud networking works without understanding how AWS and Azure and GCP are all slightly the same, but slightly different, and some things work and some things don't. I think that's probably the, the number one take. I think having a certification across clouds is, is really valuable, because we heard the global SIs, yes. especially help with the business issues. Um, what does it mean to do that? Is it code? Is it networking? Is it configuration? Is it Aviatrix? What is the, I mean, obviously Aviatrix is your, the ACE certification, but what is it about the multi-cloud that makes it multi-networking and multi-vendor? And multi, what, what is, what is the, the easy answer is yes. That's yes, true it's all of us. I was so, say. so you got to be a generalist, get your hands in all. You have to be. Yeah. Right, Great. and it, it takes experience um, because it's, um, Every, every cloud vendor has their own certification, um, whether that's sysops and, um, and advanced networking and advanced security or whatever it might be. Yeah, they can take the test, but they have no idea how to figure out what's wrong with that system. 
Um, and the same thing uh, with any certification, but it's really getting your hands in there yeah. and actually having to troubleshoot the problems, mm -hmm. you know, and actually work the problem, you know, and, and calm down. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I mean, because I don't know how many calls I've been on or even had Aviatrix join me on. It's like, okay, so everyone calm down. Let's figure out what's happening. It's like we've looked at that screen three times, looking at it again, it's not gonna solve that problem, right? But at the same time, you know, remaining calm, but knowing that it really is, I'm getting a packet from here to go over here, it's not working. So what could be the problem? You know, and actually stepping them through those scenarios. But that's like, you only get that by having to do it, you know, and, and seeing it and going through it. And then so you I get have a, it. I have a question. So we, you know, I just see it, uh, we started this program maybe six months ago. We're seeing a, a huge amount of interest. I mean, we're oversubscribed on all the training sessions. We've got people flying from around the country, even with coronavirus, flying to go to Seattle to go to these events. We're oversubscribed. A good is squadron that, leader would put their yeah. yeah. <laughs> Send them a, <laughs> yeah. Right. So is that something that you see in your organizations? Are you recommending that to people? Do you see? I mean, I'm just. I, I guess I'm surprised. I'm not surprised. But I'm really surprised by the, the demand, if you would, of this multi-cloud network certification, because there really isn't anything like that. Is that something you guys can comment on? Or do you see the same things in your organization? I see from my side, because we operate in a multi-cloud environment, so it really helps, and it's beneficial for us. Yeah. True. I think I would add that uh, um, networking guys have always needed to use certifications to prove that they know what they know. Right. Um, it's not good enough to say, yeah, I know IP addresses, or I know how a network works. And a couple little check marks or little letters by your right. name helps give you validity. Yeah. Um, so even in our team, we can say, hey, you know, we're using these certifications to know that you know enough of the basics and enough of the understandings that you have the tools necessary. Right. So, okay. I guess Great. my final question for you guys is why an ACE certification is relevant? And then, second part, share with the live stream folks who aren't yet ACE certified or might want to jump in to be. Um, AVH or certified engineers, why is it important? So why is it relevant and why should someone want to be an a certified, uh, AVH certified engineer? I think my view is a little different. I think uh, certification comes from proving that you have the knowledge, not proving that you get a certification to get, no, I mean, they're backwards. So when you've got the training and the understanding and the, you use that to prove and you can like grow your certification list with it versus studying for a test to get a certification and have no understanding of the Okay, so then who is the right person to look at this and say, I'm qualified? Is it a network engineer? Is it a DevOps person? What's your, you know, is it a certain? You know, I think cloud is really the answer. Yeah. Um, it's the, as we talked, like the edge is getting eroded, so is the network definition nice. getting eroded. We're getting more and more of some network, some DevOps, some security, lots and lots of security, because network is so involved in so many of them that it's just the next progression. Yeah. Stacey, you want to add something there? I would say I expand that to more automation engineers because we have those now, so I'd okay. probably extend it to that field as well. Jennifer, you want yeah. to? Well, I think the, the training classes themselves are, are helpful, um, especially the entry level ones for um, people who may be. Um, quote unquote cloud architects, but have never done anything in networking for them to understand why we need those things um, to really work. Uh, whether or not they go through to eventually get a certification is something mm -hmm. different, but I really think fundamentally understanding how these things work, it makes them a yeah. better architect, makes them better application developer, but even more so as you deploy more of your applications into the cloud, really getting an understanding even from our people who've traditionally done on-prem networking they can understand how that's going to work in the cloud too. Well, I know we've got just under 30 seconds left, but I want to get one more question in, just one more. For the folks watching that are maybe younger that don't have that networking training, from your experiences, each of you can answer, why should they know about networking? What's the benefit? What's in it for them? Motivate them, share some insights on why they should go a little bit deeper in networking. Stacy, we'll start with you, we'll go down. I'd say it's probably fundamental, right? If you want to deliver solutions, networking is the very top. I would say if you, um, fundamental of an operating system running on a machine, how those machines talk together um, is a fundamental change, is something that start from the base and work your way up. Jennifer? Right. Well, I think it's a challenge um, because you, you've come from top down, now you're going to start looking from bottom up and you want those different systems to cross communicate. Yeah. And say you've built something 
and your overlapping IP space, not that that doesn't happen, <laughs> but how can I actually make that still operate without having to re-IP and re-platform? It's just like those challenges, like those younger um, developers or sys engineers can really start to get their hands around mm -hmm. and understand those complexities and bring that forward in their career. They got to know how the, how the yeah. pipes are working and they got to know right. what's going to plumbing. That's right. And they got to know how it works and how to code it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you guys for great insights. Ace, cert uh, Aviation Certified Engineers, also known as ACES. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Toby, that was great. Thank you. Okay. All right, that concludes my portion. Thank you, Steve, thanks for having John, me. John, thank you very much. Thanks, that Jay. was fantastic, everybody. Round of applause for John Furrier. Yeah, so uh, great event, great event. I'm not going to take long. We got, we got lunch outside for the, for the people here. Just a couple of things, um, just call to action, right? So we saw the ACEs, you know, for those of you out on the stream here, become ACE certified, right? It's great for your career. It's great for no knowledge is, is, is fantastic. It's not just an aviatrix thing. It's going to teach you about cloud networking, multi-cloud networking with a little bit of aviatrix, exactly like the Cisco CCIE program was for IP network, that type of a thing. That's number one. Um, second thing is, 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 is learn, right? So, so there's a, there's a uh, link up there for the, for, to join the community. Again, like I started, this, this is a community, this is the kickoff to this community, and it's a movement. So go to what ABH, um, community .ABH com. We're starting a community on multi-cloud. So you know, get, get trained, learn. I'd say the next thing is we're doing over 100 seminars in, across the United States and also starting into Europe soon, um, where we'll come out and we'll actually spend a couple hours and talk about architecture and talk about those beginning things. Um, for those of you on the, you know, on the on the live stream in here as well, you know, we're coming to a city near you. Go to one of those events. It's a great way to to network with other people that are in the industry, as well as to start to learn and get on that multi-cloud journey. Um, and then I'd say the last thing is, you know, we haven't talked a lot about what Aviatrix does here, and that's intentional. We want you, you know, leaving with wanting to know more and. Schedule, get with us and schedule a multi-hour architecture workshop session. So we, we sit down with customers and we talk about where they're at in that journey and more importantly, where they're going and define that end state architecture from networking, compute, storage, everything. And everything you heard today, every panel kept talking about architecture, talking about operations. Those are the types of things that we solve. We help you define that canonical architecture, that system architecture that's yours. So, for, so many of our customers, they have three by five plotted lucid charts, architecture drawings, and it's the customer name slash aviatrix arch network architecture, and they put it on their whiteboard. That's what, what we, and that's the most valuable thing they get from us. So this becomes their 20 year network architecture drawing that they don't do anything without talking to us and look at that architecture. That's what we do in these multi-hour workshop sessions with customers, and that's super, super powerful. So if you're interested, definitely call us and let's schedule that with our team. So anyway, I just want to thank everybody on the live stream, thank everybody here. Hopefully it was, it was very useful. Um, I think it was, and uh, join the movement. And for those of you here, join us for lunch, and thank you very much. <laughs>